has already been announced. This is part of the series that we were doing a few weeks ago, and uh, I should have done when we were, I was at Bible School. So the blessings and the cursings, which uh, a little bit is contained in the chapter which we read, but the main bulk is in chapter 27, 28, and 30 of Deuteronomy. Now, when the children of Israel heard these words of Moses, they were on the other side of the River Jordan, and part of the instruction, as we read in this uh, chapter 11, was that when they went across the River Jordan, they were to take 12 stones out of the river and to take them to Gilgal and to lay them up there. But it's apparent that they weren't left at Gilgal, um, putting together what we read in chapter 11 and what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 27. It seems that those 12 stones, which will be smooth, washed by the river, uh, were carted all the way up to Shechem. Now, as the crow flies, that's about 30 miles, 50 kilometres. But by the route that they had to take because of the hills, it will be a considerably longer journey. So one has to imagine these huge stones being transported up to um, Shechem. So before the invasion really got underway, they'd taken uh, Jericho, they'd taken Gilgal and Ai and Bethel, they were now to go up to Shechem to perform this uh, ceremony that Moses had told them they must do to meet together on this mountain, um, or between the two mountains which surrounded Shechem. Now Shechem is today's Nabulus on the west bank. To the north is Mount Ebal and to the south is Mount Gerizim. And it was a place that was full of meaning for the children of Israel because it was here that Abraham on his journey from Ur of the Chaldees journeyed all the way around the Euphrates eventually comes to Shechem and God says this is the land. So this was his first indication that this was the land that God had promised to him. And it was to Shechem that Jacob, having got his wives and his family, having left Haran, uh, again his first stop really was at Shechem. And it was here that uh, they buried the household gods which had come with them from Haran. We know that at Shechem was Jacob's well, which features in John's Gospel. And Acts chapter 7, verse 16, tells us that this was the place where Joseph was buried uh, when eventually he, uh, his bones came up at, um, out of uh, Egypt. So it was a significant uh, place for the children of Israel and they had to come to this spot. It was a very wonderful spot, a very verdant spot. Because of the two mountains on either side, it meant there were lots of springs of water, about 40 springs in the locality. So it was a very verdant area. Travellers in the old days would remark on how wonderful it was, this particular spot. And it forms a natural amphitheatre between the two mountains. And as this slide which I've pulled off the internet says, scientists have tested its, uh, this natural amphitheater many times and it works. So there's a natural basin at the town now in the middle of it. At that time, there would, uh, presumably wasn't anything there. And as I say, Mount Ebal to the north and uh, Gerizim to the south. And the tribes of Israel had to split into two groups. Half of them were on Mount Ebal, half on Mount Gerizim. And in the middle were the Levites with the Ark. And it does say in the authorised version that they went up onto the mountain. Probably um, the Hebrew doesn't necessarily signify having to go high up on the mountain. They were presumably on the lower slopes of the two mountains. And was a perfect amphitheatre for what was to follow. And these 12 stones, which they had hauled all the way out of Jordan, far Gilgal, up to here, were placed, covered in gypsum to give a white surface, and then Moses, uh, not Moses uh, Joshua was to inscribe the law 
of Moses on it. Uh, we're told in 27, chapter 27, verse 8, Thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And Joshua 8 tells us of the actual happening or when they did it. And it's described there as a copy of the law of Moses. So it wasn't just the curses which we read about in chapter 27. It, it was a copy of the law of Moses. So it would take some time to write. Um, there's an example of a code, uh, the code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi, which is written on that steely, and that contains about 8,000 words. And that's a pretty tall thing. So on 12 stones, how big the stones were, we don't know, but be quite a big writing area for the writing of the law of Moses. So the tribes were divided not randomly but in a certain order. First of all Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar and then skipping over to Joseph and Benjamin form one group and they were to the south on Mount Gerizim. And then Reuben who was uh, Leah's eldest uh, together with Gad and Asher and Dan and Naphtali and Zebulun um, were on the Mount Ebal to the north. So the sons of the concubines together with Reuben and Zebulun uh, form the northern group who said amen to the curses and the others were on the southern mount who presumably, though it isn't recorded, said amen to the blessings. So that was the division um, of them. Uh, it would be rather a forceful reminder to the tribe of Reuben that Reuben did disgrace himself. He lay with Bilhar and so um, received sad words when Jacob blessed his sons uh, and he was uh, had to go with the uh, children of the handmaids. Uh, Zebulun was the youngest child there and uh, he too went with them to make up the numbers. So if we just turn to chapter 27 we read there of the occasion of the uh, speaking of these words so if we go in at verse 11 um, Moses charged the people the same day saying verse 12 these shall stand about on Mount Gerizim um, to bless the people and list the people we've looked at and verse 13 uh, these shall stand at Ebal and again we've looked at those numbers and the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer, Amen. So we would, uh, if we read between the lines, we would say, well, it's those six tribes who are on Mount uh, Ebal, they had to reply, Amen, at each of the twelve curses uh, which uh, follow. That's the first of the curses. Now, the children of Israel were roughly about two million people. So you imagine, you know, a million people to the north, a million people to the south, uh, the Levites in the middle, that uh, it would be a very solemn occasion as these curses were read out and a million people had to raise their voices and say, Amen, give their assent to it. Now, uh, rather than read through the rest of Deuteronomy 27, um, these are things, and they're all matters which normally happen in secret and we read didn't we um, putting them in a secret place many sins are secret some are open but many sins are secret so uh, they were cursed if they erected secret idols despised parents moved landmarks led the blind astray perverted judgment lay with their mother uh, an animal a sister or a mother-in-law smite neighbours secretly, slay innocent people and a catch-all refuse to obey uh, these laws. So those were the 12 curses and 12 times 
the tribes on the northern mount would have to say amen to them. God was indicating that there was nothing hidden from him. God is holy and he expects his children to be holy. If we just go back to Numbers 27, uh, Deuteronomy, sorry, Deuteronomy 27 and verse 9, part way through. Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. So he's saying, God has called you to be his people. Therefore, you must obey him. You must avoid doing wrongdoing. If you disobey, then God will bring curses upon you. Now, if we just go to Psalm 106, I think we have an echo of this particular occasion and what happened there. Psalm 106 details the history of their journey through the wilderness and all the things that happened to them and it's quite a, a wonderful bringing together of the wilderness journey and then it, it concludes in verse 47 save us O Lord our God and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, Hallelujah. The word Amen doesn't occur very often in the Old Testament, but there seems to be the psalmist is uh, picking up the thoughts of what had happened and this incident of the children of Israel assembling to hear the blessings and the curses. And there is a, another passage in Jeremiah chapter 11, which the authorised version masks for us by its translation, but um, it is the word Amen. Jeremiah chapter 11, just reading the first few verses because it's all relevant. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. So a clear echo, God saying, You're going to be my people, I'm going to be your God that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, authorised version, so be it, margin, amen. That's the word for amen, O Lord. So again, Jeremiah has got an echo of the incident there. These um, curses to uh, avoid by... If they were obedient, then they would be blessed. And Jeremiah says, Amen to that. So, what about the corresponding blessings? Well, here we have a problem, because they're not listed. We have blessings in the next chapter, but no uh, record of them being the blessings to which the children of Israel on the southern mountain said, Amen to. And it's rather interesting that uh, just the curses are recorded, the blessings aren't recorded for us. There are nine blessings in chapter 28. Uh, and again, I'll just pull them up as summary. Um, blessing, you'll be blessed. If you obey my words, then you'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. The fruit of your body and your ground and your cattle will be blessed. You'll be blessed in basket and store. You'll be blessed when you come in. You'll be blessed when you go out and your enemies will be smitten. Your storehouses will be blessed and you'll be blessed in the land. So there are eight blessings. Whether the blessings that were enumerated were based on these, we have no means of knowing. 
what we do know is that there was in chapter 28 which is the main chapter of blessings and cursings which form the basis of tonight's talk there were far more curses or a, a longer list of curses there are actually um oh sorry nine blessings yes all the work of your hand was the ninth blessing so the curses are slightly different list to what we had in chapter 27 and the word cursed uh, only occurs six times in Deuteronomy 28. I'll be cursed in the city, cursed in the field, cursed in basket and store, cursed in fruit, body, land, cattle, flock, cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out and your uh, enemies will be victorious. Uh, and we know that chapter 28 is predominantly uh, a chapter of curses. If we, I just counted up, well I didn't count up um, word, counted up for me, the number of words which involved in the blessings and the number of words which were involved in the cursings and the number of words in the curses was almost four times more. So uh, either think of it linearly or think of it as surface area. Um, that's the correspondence between the blessings and the curses. So let's just look at the detail of chapter 28. The first 14 verses occupy the blessings and then 15 to 68, all the curses. Now those curses are divided into five sections. The, uh, from verse 15 to 19 is a reversal of the blessings of uh, verses 3 to 6. And then there's another section of curses which are, seem to be a kind of contrast between um, the... the uh, blessings in verse 7 to 14 and there's another similar parallel section where again there is a contrast in verses 27 to 37 and then a third section of contrasts uh, 38 to 48 and then there is the fifth section dealing with the invasion and defeat of Israel and then finally the scattering and cursing of Israel so we're not going to look at all that detail, it will take too long and it will be rather repetitive. But it's quite interesting, now, can you read it? It's the smallest font I've ever used, I think, but uh, if you can, um, that was the only way I could uh, convey it. So the yellow is what is common to both. The uh, green are the contrast, blessings, curses. Um, so you can see just how uh, verses 15 to 19 um, are a reversal of the blessings. You know, you can, you can match them almost word for word. So if they were going to be obedient, then all good things would happen. But God made it quite clear. And we've got to remember that Moses is speaking these words to the nation of Israel before they'd ever gone into the land. They conquered the eastern side, but within a few days, a couple of days probably, of speaking these words, Moses will be dead. There'll be the period of mourning, and then they will go in. And what is remarkable, the, the kind of things that this commander-in-chief of his nation was telling his people, and it's quite obvious that these aren't Moses' words, these are God's words. Now, some of the things that are described here that we shall see would, wouldn't even have entered into Moses' head. Um, yet, God put these words into his mouth, and we can see just how accurately they came to pass. So, you know, a, a, a balance there. And uh, again, uh, the contrast between verses 7 to uh, 14, this goes to verse 11. Uh, again, same scheme that yellow is the common between them. So, you know, they, they had the choice. It was laid out uh, in black and white. The uh, contrasts that were theirs. They either had to have faith in God, that God had told them to do this, that and the other, and they obeyed, or if they chose to disobey. And God made it clear that his hand will be strong upon them. So what I want to look at is the historical fulfilment of these words. Uh, the 
first part from verse 21 to 24 would cover the period when they'd gone into the land and uh, these were calamities that would come upon them while they were in the land. And the first thing that would happen was they would have pestilence or plague. The word for cleave, I just highlighted that, it has the idea of glue sticking to them. Now we don't read in many places of pestilences in Israel, but we can be quite sure from the record here that this would be a common occurrence when all sorts of medical problems would come upon them. Um, as well as uh, 23 and 24, drought and famine. And of course, the whole story of the Book of Ruth hinges around the famine that was in the time um, of uh, Ruth and his, the family having to move to Moab. So there were certainly were many times of drought in the time of Elijah, Elisha. Um, God uses these means to punish his people. Then the next section speaks of them of being invaded and dominated by foreigners. Uh, and God warned them that uh, instead of driving their enemies and their enemies fleeing seven ways, it would be they that would flee seven ways before their enemies. And historically we know how in the time of Hezekiah the Two and a half tribes on the east were taken into captivity and the ten tribes were taken into captivity. And for a long period, right from the time of the judges and on through many of the kings, many times their enemies came into the land, spoiled them, took their crops, came at harvest time when everything had been gathered in, would come along, swoop up and take it away. And God used these punishments to make his people think and to repent, as they did many times in the times of the judges. When we get to verse 36 and 37, we've moved on in the historical period to the Babylonian captivity, when their king was taken um, to a nation that their fathers hadn't known, um, and there they would serve other gods of wood and stone, and there they would become the astonishment, a proverb and a byword among the nations whither the Lord shall lead them. So in one application that would be the ten tribes who were scattered into many countries became lost as it were uh, and in the time of Jehoiachin he was taken into Babylon and Zedekiah of course was taken there, blinded um, but the king, their king, Israel's king um, was taken captive and the people were scattered. Then there is a section which they obviously return back to the land, the inference from the verses from 38, uh, 38 to 46, they return to the land, but troubles continue and they are under the dominion of foreigners. And this covers the period of uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the time between the Testaments. And finally, we come to the bit which is more familiar to us when we read Deuteronomy 28, because we have the contemporary recordings of Josephus who experienced the time of the domination by the Romans, and that covers from verse 47 to 62, and then the end of the chapter covers their scattering by the Romans into all nations of the world. And it is a wonderful testimony to us of the accuracy of the word of God because the great detail that is in there, and I just want to spend a few moments just looking at some of the accuracy in uh, just these few verses here. Layer upon layer of detail which ensure that this couldn't be the thoughts of man this must be the hand of God who knows all things. So he starts off by saying he's going to put a yoke of neck, a yoke of iron upon their neck. Now, that is a phrase that is used of other nations in the Old Testament. But we know how pertinent it was to the uh, Roman nation because the uh, iron rule of Rome, yoke of iron, 
is something which historians talk about if this will move on doesn't seem to want to um, so these are just some of the phrases I've just plucked off the internet which iron is a symbol uh, as we know used in Daniel chapter 2 but it is a symbol which other right historians uh, when writing of Rome use that phrase so a yoke of iron was very applicable to the Roman nation and that yoke was going to be put upon their neck until they were destroyed and we know how it was the Romans that brought to an end the Jewish nation in AD 70 and it would take to 1948 before they became a nation again and the description that God gives of this nation that was going to come upon them uh, as, as being a nation against you from afar from the end of the earth is again so accurate because the children of Israel had uh, were to experience uh, many captivities um, Moses was standing there I'm sorry it is being very slow in moving on um, they were had come out of Egypt and so had experienced the problems of Egypt let's just try and doing it by hand Uh, they were to go into Babylon and into Persia. Uh, Greece was to have dominion over them. But as far as Rome was concerned, Rome hadn't even been founded, had it? It had been another 900 years before Rome was founded. Uh, and as far as somebody living uh, in the land of Israel, Italy was the ends of the earth. So a remarkably accurate description, not only of a yoke of iron, uh, and a nation that's going to bring them to an end, but a nation which comes from afar. And uh, this, by the way, is the ESV. It just, just livens it up a little bit. Um, so they're going to come from the ends of the earth, swooping down like the eagle. And again, we know how the Bible does use the symbol of eagle for the uh, Syrians, but it is also very applicable to the Romans. That was their symbol that they carried around with them, and so very much associated with the power of Rome. And the other aspect was that this nation would have a language which they didn't understand. And again, it is very interesting, to, just a comment that I found, that Hebrew and Latin are chalk and cheese, there is no language more foreign in, to the structure and idiom of Hebrew than Latin. So, you know, here was a wonderful foretelling. We know that the Romans were to come nearly two and a half thousand years on from when God revealed these things to Moses. So, impossible for Moses to have known. Only God, who knows all things, could pull together all these different facets. So that when they came to pass, in the time of the Lord Jesus, they would be able to read Deuteronomy 28 and they could see that there was trouble would lie ahead. And then the final part there, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old nor show mercy to the young. Again, not exclusive to the Romans. The Assyrians were pretty brutal and Babylonians were only a bit better. But again, the Romans, this was characteristic. They were very tough. The harshness ingrained in Romans was the product of long conflict with man and nature. His character was formed in this hard school, and centuries of rough existence bred in him an acceptance of savagery, dealt out and received a reputation for depravity. And you didn't wish to meet uh, two of these on the road if you could avoid it. And again, the next part of the description is very applicable to how Rome worked that uh, they had to live off the conquered nation's uh, land they were expected to supply food for the benefit of the Roman peoples and so eating uh, the offspring of your cattle and the fruit of your ground until you're destroyed 
shall not leave you grain, wine, oil, or increase of your herds or young or flock until they have caused you to perish. Um, we know how the Romans did, obliterated everything. And that was uh, Caesar's policy. As their power spread, the Romans began to demand tribute and slaves from their conquered peoples. Conquered people were no longer given Roman citizenship. Instead, they were governed by Roman governors. Often the governors and the tax collectors were greedy and dishonest. And finally, that section concludes with, They shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And we know how Jerusalem was specifically targeted, but they had, in the previous years, had travelled all through Judea and had uh, brought much destruction. And the remains of those stones can be seen to this day. And Jerusalem was indeed destroyed. And so absolutely remarkable curses upon them coming to pass in exactly the detail that God had outlined there. And then the final clincher to my mind as to the, the authenticity of this being the word of God is this um, verse in Deuteronomy chapter, in verse 53, where he speaks of them in the straightness of the siege, eating the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God hath given you in the siege and in the distress which your enemies shall distress you. Now, I, I submit to you, it will be an impossibility for a leader of his people, having led them to the edge of this land that they were going to possess, to ever come into his mind that one day the situation in that land will be so dire that they will be forced to eat their own children. It's, uh, I submit, it just lies outside normal human thinking, doesn't it? But this was recorded. It was written down and preserved for two and a half thousand years. So that when Josephus comes along and sees that reality, he pens these words. The Roman armies at length besieged, sacked and utterly desolated Jerusalem. And during the siege, the famine was so extreme that even rich and refined persons ate their own children and concealed the horrible repast, lest others should tear it from them. So that demonstrates that this must be the word of God. And we know it doesn't end there. It speaks of them being scattered from one end of the earth to the other. There you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And they were truly scattered, and we find Jews in virtually every country of the world. And there were many forcible conversions, the, especially in Europe. They were forced to convert or die. Many of them died, but others were converted and worshipped other gods, the gods of Christians um, who uh, served many idols. So these words came to pass. And the conditions that they would experience, which... Moses outlines to his people, as I say, they hadn't even gone into the land. And here he is speaking of them being scattered and facing all sorts of troubles. You shall find no respite. You shall find no resting place for the sole of your foot. The Lord will give you there trembling of heart and failing of life and languishing of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. Day and night you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning thou shalt say, if only it were evening. And the evening you would say, if only it were morning, because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sight that your eyes shall see. And we know that that is an accurate summary of the history of the Jewish people for the past 2,000 years. They've been scattered into every nation and experienced persecutions. And uh, I know I put this up before, but Martin Gilbert, who died quite recently in his forward to the Jewish History Atlas uh, has this to say. 
My original concern was to avoid undue emphasis upon the many horrific aspects of Jewish history. I wish to portray with equal force the construction, achievements and formalities of Jewish life through almost 4,000 years. In part, I believe that I have succeeded, for there are many maps of traders and philosophers and financiers, settlers and sages. But as my research into Jewish history progressed, I was surprised, depressed, and to some extent overwhelmed by the irrational hatred, perpetual and irrational violence, which pursued the Jews in every century and to almost every corner of the globe. If therefore persecution, expulsion, torture, humiliation and mass murder haunt these pages, it is because they haunt the Jewish story. And so that, as we know, is a, a very powerful chapter, but a very sad chapter. And because the children of Israel were disobedient, the blessings turned to curses, and they have experienced the punishing hand of God upon them as a nation. But... That punishment has been for a purpose. God hasn't just abandoned them. We know God in his purpose is regathering them and is refining them. And their experiences of 2,000 years of persecution has shaped their character, ready for that final test when they are besieged and overwhelmed yet once again when the Gogan forces come down. Now, chapter 29... Uh, seems a, a, a bit odd because it is dropped in because chapter 30 starts and it shall come to pass when all these things have come upon thee, the blessings and the curse. So obviously chapter 30 is a continuation of chapter 28. So what's chapter 29? Why has that been slotted in? Well, I think this is uh, an important chapter. If we just read the uh, first few verses. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant that he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called all the Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh, great temptations, verse 5, I've led you for 40 years, um, you come to this place, verse 7, and uh, his appeal, uh, verse 9, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. Um, and so they make a covenant. Now, the original covenant was on Mount Sinai 39 years earlier. This wasn't a different covenant. I think this was a covenant which was renewing the things that uh, had happened there. But there was, is in this chapter here, more references to the things of Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, or as we would say, the new covenant, because the new covenant and the Abrahamic covenant are the same thing, just uh, extensions in time. And he makes reference uh, to the things here. So, verse 12, um, that thou shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee to die for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. Neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us this day. In other words, this is a covenant which is spanning not just for you standing here, but is spanning forward to future generations who will not be here. Uh, and so I think there is a, an echo there of the things of the uh, Abrahamic, the new covenant, which... Uh, at the end of Israel's two and a half thousand year wilderness journey, then they will be brought into the new covenant. So we just keep our fingers there and just go to those well-known words in Jeremiah chapter 31, where Jeremiah makes it clear that this Abrahamic covenant is the new covenant, the covenant that we've been very privileged to enter into before our nation of Israel. And in verse 31... 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant, the Sinai covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was an husband unto them. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with it the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So that is the basis, that's the heart of the Abrahamic covenant. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, they will be my people. And forgiveness uh, in the Lord Jesus, their Messiah. So I think that this chapter 29, when we look at the historical, we've seen Israel scattered. In chapter 30 we're going to see them gathered back in. And it hinges around the work of the new covenant. The work of the Lord Jesus has made possible this redemption of Israel. So I think God deliberately slotted it in here, the, these details here, um, to prepare us for this wonderful revelation. Though God's going to punish you, yet he is going to restore you. And so that leads us into chapter 30, um, where we have this wonderful restoration um, at the end of their long journey. So just read these first five verses of this uh, wonderful chapter. And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse that I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whether the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out into the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will, he, will the Lord thy God gather thee and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed and thou shalt possess it. And he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. So a wonderful promise. I know there are um, ifs in it, if, but God knows the certainty of it. God has been working so that when this final scattering and dispersal of Israel takes place, when God comes down upon the land, that there will be a remnant prepared to cry out to God and seek his salvation and will turn to him and accept their Messiah, as Zechariah tells us, uh, and will be a holy and a righteous people. And so um, we, we've seen the Jews come back in great numbers, but we know from other scriptures that sadly there is still trouble ahead for Israel. This isn't the final restoration because as he goes on in verse 6 the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live and the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and upon them that hate thee which persecute thee and thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command thee this day now that isn't the situation today, but that will be the situation in the day when they are saved from their enemies and Israel becomes a blessing in the midst of the land when they accept Messiah and walk in faith and righteousness. And so it's uh, quite appropriate to see the exhortation which Moses spoke to Israel so they hadn't even gone into the land, let alone transgressed, let alone been scattered, let alone come back. And we're living in this era when that coming back in part, a, a foretaste of what is to come. And we'll just close by reading um, verses 11 to 14 and then just see Paul's echo of that. 
for this commandment, Moses says to them, and he echoes down to us today, this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, who can go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, who shall go over unto the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. And brothers and sisters, that same word is nice. It's in our hands. And we have to make it live. We have to make it so it's in our hearts and in our minds. Unless we do that, then it will just be an empty book. But in the mercy of God, <clears throat> if we make these things true and living, then it gives us hope. And we won't actually turn to it, but in, in Romans chapter 10, verse 6 to 8, Paul takes these words and shows that it is because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus and the wonderful hope that he has given us that, that the promises made to Abraham will realise their completion when the kingdom is established and Israel is at peace. And in the mercy of God, we will be with our Lord Jesus to help him in that wonderful work of taking this word of God to the nations around us. So, fearful words of cursing, wonderful prospect. How thankful we are that we have a God who cares for his people and has all things under his control.